for tonight. And I'm believing God's going to give us something tonight from the Word. And uh, I do appreciate, and He'll no doubt honor your faithfulness. And for that, this evening we're grateful. We're in Psalms chapter 124. And uh, looking forward to getting into this precious psalm. See what God will say to us from the Word tonight. Psalm 124, the Bible says this. It says, should be there at the top of your psalm. It should say, a song of degrees of David, if you have a subscription or above that in your, in your Bible. In verse 1, he says this. If, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, here's what would have happened. Then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. The there is talking about the ones that rose up against them in verse 2. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who hath made heaven and earth. I'm interested in a phrase that is repeated in verses 1 and 2, very applicable to everybody in the building. The psalmist here makes this statement. He said, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. <laughs> That's humbling, is it not? And then he tells you what would have happened in their life. And can I say tonight that if it had not been for the Lord... Only God knows where we'd be and what we'd be and how messed up our lives would be if it had not been for the Lord. That's the title of our message tonight. It's very simple. It's just simply this, if it had not been for the Lord. Tonight's message should be designed, this psalm is designed to recall in your life what God intervening and interjecting himself into your life through salvation has done for you. And not only what it's done for you, but most likely what it has saved you from. Amen. I'm not going to ask you to use your imagination tonight because we really don't know, do we? But I tell you what we can do. We can look around us and see others who hadn't had that experience of having an interaction of faith with the Lord and only imagine where your life might be, might be tonight if it wasn't for him. So for a few minutes this evening, I want to preach if it had not been for the Lord. Unless you and I ask God to help us tonight from the preaching of his word. Brother Al Parson, if you would please pray for us. Amen and amen. We thank the Lord this evening for the reading of his word. I've not really probably brought this out a lot, but I will make mention of it here tonight. We are, we are in a section of the Psalms uh, here in, and, and I'm not sure exactly where they start and where they end. I just know we're in this section of the Psalms that is referred to generally as Deuteronomy Psalms. You and I know that the book of Deuteronomy was a call to remembrance. Uh, it was a book basically where what God had said to the original group that come out of Egypt's land, maybe over in the book of Numbers, was being repeated to the next generation that would outlive them because God's word and God's will and God's ways never change. So the book of Deuteronomy is basically just a restating of something that had already been said before for the purpose of recalling back to remembrance the things that were needful for those children of God. And can I say, it's fitting that this would be classified as a Deuteronomy psalm because basically that's exactly what this psalm is doing. It is calling to remembrance for you and I what our lives might have been, the defeats we may have faced, and the things that might have come our way had it not been for the Lord 
interjecting himself in our life. I want to say this tonight, not only is it a, a Deuteronomy psalm, a psalm to call to remembrance, but it's also a worship psalm. By the time you get done going through Psalm 124, it really should place the believer in a state of worship in their life because, I mean, whenever you think about what you are and where you are and, and had that been different, had God not showed up in your life, it'll make you worship Him. I mean, it puts you in a place of adoration for the Savior because, I don't know about you, but I, I agree with the Apostle Paul when he made this statement, and I know this for a fact, I am what I am by the grace of God. Not by the goodness that I have in my own heart and life. Not because of Bible knowledge or even, you know, being raised around church culture. None of those things could have ever made me what I am today. I simply am what I am because I have had an interaction with God's good grace. And I want to say this. You talk about a place for a child of God to settle down and stay. I mean, you ought to visit that often in your heart and remember as we walk out in this world that every sinner, regardless of where you find them at, regardless of the depths of sin they're in, how far they've gone, had it not been for God's grace, so go I. There's not one. I mean, you, you named the most grotesque sin known to humanity today. Had it not been for an interaction with the grace of God, I could be there tonight. Amen. I don't ever want to forget that. I don't ever want to get on a religious high horse and forget where I, where he found me and where he brought me from along the way. Now, I want to state in this tonight by way of introduction, some of the psalms that we have been preaching through are short in size but very powerful in content. That is kind of where Psalm 124 kind of falls in classification. And because of that tonight, the message this evening may not be long, but it does not mean that it cannot be impactful in mind in your lives. It's very interesting. As a matter of fact, if you study the message of the Bible, you'll actually find both Jesus and others who preached. If you read their sermons, a lot of times you can read those sermons in 10 minutes or less. Now, don't expect for preaching to start becoming 10 minutes or less. You drive too far for that, and I have more to say than I can need to say in 10 minutes or less. I'm just saying this, that, 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 that in, in short messages, God can do a lot of work. I think about uh, the Apostle Peter's message at Pentecost. He probably, if you sit down and read it, it may take five to seven minutes to read through that message. And I'm of the persuasion the Holy Spirit had it dictated basically verbatim the way he preached it. So in a five to seven minute message, 3,000 people got saved. I guess we're just in worse shape. It takes 45 or hours some time to get us straightened out, right? And uh, so the goal tonight is not always to have a long service, but I tell you what the goal always is to have an impactful one. And as we study Psalm 124 tonight, I'll be honest with you, if you just sit back in your seat and think about that phrase that's been repeated twice in verse 1 and 2, if it had not been for the Lord, you could almost just have an altar call on that one statement. If it had not been for the Lord. Now we know by, if, you're, if your Bible has a subscription above it, we understand tonight that this psalm right here is attributed to David. And the contents of this psalm tonight tell us that there are several personal events in David's life that he could have in mind or could be referencing. I mean, you know, David was a man that had a battle with Goliath the giant. David was a man that has struggled, or had a several struggles with his father-in-law, King Saul. His family feud with Absalom could be some of the enemies he's talking about here in this psalm. But I really believe he's also using some historical uh, events in the, in the life of Israel. He makes reference there in verses, uh, let's see, verse 4, he talks about the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. I believe he's probably referencing whenever the nation of Israel was running from Pharaoh's army and had it not been for the Lord parting the Red Sea, Brother DJ, they would have been destroyed as they were walking across on dry ground. If it had not been for the provision of God to keep those walls of water held back, they would have drowned there when they crossed the Jericho River. Amen. I'm Jericho River. The Jordan River to go into Jericho. I'm sorry, it's Wednesday night. Uh, no doubt, had God not held that back as well, they would have drowned and or suffered casualty or loss. I mean, God's intervention in the life of the nation of Israel and in David's life is replete throughout the Scriptures. So let's you and I dive in tonight and see exactly what we can learn about the subject if it had not been for the Lord. Well, first of all, we see this. If it had not been for the Lord, we'd be hopeless. He said in verse 1 and 2, and he sets up the rest of the psalm with that phrase, verse 1, he said, uh, he said, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, now Israel may say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. And then he goes in to all the reasons. And I want to say this tonight, we need to start the psalm out and make sure we grasp and understand this very clearly. We don't need to make a mistake. We
Right. You say, what in the world does that mean if it had not been for the Lord being on our side? Well, before we answer that question, let's get, get realistic. What could fallen men who are dead spiritually offer to God? The answer is nothing. We had absolutely nothing to give him. I mean, the song says, or the song goes like this, nothing in my hand I bring, only to the cross I cling. I brought God nothing. He came looking for me, came looking for you. We were dead in trespass in sin. We were without ability to go find God. So you know what God did? Making provision, he came and found us. Man, I love those stories in the Bible where you talk about over in Luke chapter 15 where the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes looking for that lost sheep. I mean, the Bible, I mean, just parable after parable, story after story. Jesus even said when he was on this earth that he came to seek and save that which was lost. He came on a mission. He was, he was looking for gold. He was looking for things of high value, and he chose to come looking for you and I, right? God didn't need us. God doesn't need us. However, he chose to do something for us. Man, it's humbling when you, when you just really start rolling that around in your heart and mind. It's, it, it'll just humble you naturally. Now, back to the question at hand. The question was, the Lord, or what does it mean for the Lord to be on our side? Here's exactly what it means. If you want to write this down, you can. It means simply this, that he intervened on our behalf and he interjected himself into our lives. Every story of salvation you'll find in the scriptures, one of two things happened. Either Jesus met someone personally and confronted them about where they were in their spiritual condition and salvation uh, took place because they chose to believe in Christ or someone took the message of the gospel to lost people and the, the message of the gospel was preached and people were pricked in their hearts. Some responded in faith and received salvation. Some rejected the gospel, but it, it all happens the same way. Everybody gets saved different, but we all get saved the same way. Maybe a different place, a different time, a different age from different backgrounds, but it all comes through that interaction with the Lord, right? And so the Lord shows up in our life. He intervenes. He interjects himself. And I want to say this tonight, Again, make no mistake about it, we did not seek him, he sought us. I think about what we were studying a few months back in the book of Romans chapter 3, and starting in verse 9, here's what the apostle Paul said to the Christians at Rome. He said, what then are we, talking about the Jews better than they, talking about the Gentiles, no and no, and no wise, we have been proved before both Jews and Gentiles all are under sin. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none, he said, that seeketh after God. That was a blow to the Jews because they had a couple thousand years of historically having a religion called Judaism that, 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 that had a history with the God of the Bible, but it had become basically a dead religion. It was without relationship. And he let them know there, he said, guess what? The Gentiles couldn't seek God. They didn't know who he was. And you weren't seeking God, and you knew who he was. That's amazing to me. He said in verse number 11 of Romans 3, there's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all going out of the way. They're all become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So nobody's seeking after God. God isn't lost, by the way. You look for something that's lost. God's not lost. Man is. But aren't you glad whenever God, knowing our condition, knew we could not help ourselves, knew we could not find him, even if we wanted to, he came looking for us. <laughs> what a Savior. Amen. And here's the amazing thing. After man is found or after man is saved, you know what? He still needs God to save him from his enemies, which is what will come up here in the text in a minute. And then a lot of times, listen closely, God, man needs God to save him from himself. God has had to save me from me a whole lot of times in my life. I'm glad God knows how much of a liability I am. I'm glad God's patient and God's long suffering. Praying, we do that out in prayer. If, if I didn't know exactly what I needed, I'm glad that the Lord has set it up where the Spirit of God was making intercession for me. I promise you this tonight the will of God got prayed for in my life and yours. Because maybe I'm praying about this over here, Brother Anthony, and I think a situation will take this turn, and the Holy Spirit says, not really. <laughs> right. 
And he's praying for me and I'm praying for one thing. Ain't no telling how many times I've prayed for something and the Holy Ghost be praying something totally different. I'm glad God heard him and listens to him sometimes when he can't listen to me. Amen. Like I say, sometimes he has to save me from myself. So we see here that if it had not been for the Lord, we would have been hopeless. Number two, we see this in verses number two through five. If it had not been for the Lord, our situation would have turned out differently. Notice what he says at the back part of verse number two. After he says, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, he says this, when men rose up against us. So in other words, here comes the adversary, and now he's going to show you and I the outcome. What's what happens in verse number three? Then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. In other words, he said, if it had not been for the Lord, we'd have been swallowed up. Verse four, then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then, verse 5, the proud waters had gone over our soul. In other words, if the Lord had not intervened and protected us, our situation would have turned out differently. Now, we see a few things jumping off the page here at us. First of all, I want you and I to see this evening how it happens. How, how, do we, how does all this come about? Well, we see, number one here, our adversaries rise up against us, and it looks like, Brother DJ, the attack comes unsuspectingly. There are biblical examples of that. I think about Eve in the Bible, the first one that really, where you see an adversarial attack really just come to the forefront of the Word of God. Here Eve is, I guess, doing her normal routine. She's in the garden that day. I don't know where Adam's at. He wasn't playing golf because there wasn't no golf yet. Uh, he probably wasn't even hunting. I mean, I don't know where he was, but he wasn't around Eve. And I don't know where the adversary shows up and starts a conversation in which he puts question marks where God's already put periods. Beware of that in your life. Anytime you start finding yourself questioning in dark times what God has already put in a period or explanation point on in the light, then guess what? You're being messed with by the adversary. And so Eve here has this encounter where her adversary rises up. And you know, here's the, here's the thing that's so crippling about it. It's not like it was a series of conversations that led to her demise. It was one. One conversation is all it took the adversary to talk her into making the biggest mistake of her life, which would ultimately affect her family and all of humanity by the time Adam takes part in that. The adversary rose up against her in one day. I think about another example, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Joseph had been sold by his brothers, lied about to his father, found himself being positioned where he finally could maybe start making some headway in life. He gets out of prison, starts working around the... Uh, no, 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 he didn't get out of prison yet. He's getting her to go to prison, my bad. He's down at Potiphar's house, and he's, he's, he's gained some favor there, and he's, he's gained enough to where he's working inside the quarters, and all of a sudden, uh, one false accusation out of nowhere got him put in prison. The adversary rose up that quick. Now, I'm glad that God protected him through that encounter, gave him the wisdom and knowledge to decipher some dreams and get back out so he could position him where he wanted to. But hang on a second. If God don't intervene on behalf, on behalf of Joseph, where's Joseph end up dead? Amen. I think about David in the case of Bathsheba. I don't, I don't know where. Somewhere he shouldn't have been, no doubt, on a rooftop at that time of the day when all the kings were going off to war. He should have been on the battlefield. Yes, he had in just like that, the adversary shows up and his whole life takes a different turn in a moment of making a bad decision. Now, make no mistake about it. Listen now, our adversary does not have our best interest at heart. I wish we'd married that idea. I wish we as God's people would realize when the temptations of the flesh come that the adversary is not looking out for our best. He has got a plan in place. Jesus described him like this in John chapter 10 and verse number 10. Listen closely. He said this, the thief is what he called him. Cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. In other words, you know what the adversary wants for your life? Steal it, kill it, and destroy it. Jesus said, but I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, when we hear that, you got you to process that the way he meant it. He didn't mean that he came so that we could please our flesh and live in the sins he would die for. That's not what the kind of abundant life he's talking about. 
He's talking about this. Don't listen to the adversary. Don't, don't fall prey to the temptations that pull you away. He said, you stick close to me, walk with me, and I'll give you not only a life, but an abundant one. Amen. The adversary, listen to me. This, the adversary has, has a plan for everybody in this building tonight. It's to steal your life, kill your life, and it's to destroy your life. Here's the billion-dollar question. Knowing that he wants to destroy us, why do we cooperate with his temptations? I don't know about you, but most of the time I know when the bait has been laid. I know when the allurement is there. And the sad part is, it's not like, listen, the adversary is not omnipresent everywhere. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He don't, he don't, he's not God. He don't know your thoughts. But I tell you what he does do. He's been good at studying human behavior for a long time and you know the sad part he's getting us today with the same stuff he was getting the first generation after creation with no he don't have to have no tricks it, it, humanity can never get to the place to where oh we got him figured out and now he can't win any more victories not nah, if it wasn't for the lord being on our side we wouldn't have any shot at all we wouldn't have any we wouldn't have any hope right and our problem is so many times we cooperate with the temptations of the adversary and ignore the leading of the Lord. And there's a battle going on in all this. Listen to me closer now. And if we do not allow God, as he takes our side to lead us, our situations are going to turn out differently. Do you know what I'm well aware of tonight? Do you, are you, listen to me. Are you, I'm well aware that I, as a pastor, could become a statistic. I'd be a fool to think anything else. I would be a fool to think it happens to everybody else or it happens to others, but it would never happen to me. That's foolish thinking. I'm, I'm, I would be a fool tonight to think that my marriage is so safe that I don't have to still walk by the precepts of the Word of God and do right that it couldn't never falter. I'd be a fool. I'd be a fool tonight, Brother DJ, to think I could live up off the gas in my Christian life and, start, and coast on to the grave. I'd be a fool. Because the only thing that saved me thus far is the fact the Lord's been on my side. And without him being on my side and without me cooperating and letting him lead me along the way, this thing would be turning out a whole lot differently than it has thus far. So first we see how it happens, and then we see what happens. In verse 3, he says, then, verse 4, then, verse 5, then. And he just keeps giving the attacks over and over and over. The adversary came and came and came, and the only thing that caused their circumstances to come out on the right side of things wasn't their intellect, it wasn't their ability to pray, it wasn't their spiritual power, it was the fact God was involved. Amen. Now, with that being said, let me ask you a question tonight. You ever think about what your life would look like had the Lord not intervened? I know this, I can think back to a few situations and I cannot say that I cheated death I can only say, had it not been for the Lord. I was getting, I, I, the way I usually study for a message like this, I'll look over at Monday, and it's like can and beans. I like to let it soak a while. You know, so I start looking over it on Monday, and then I start digging in on Tuesday, and then I finish up on Wednesday, and I bring it in here to try to preach it. But Monday, boy, when I looked into this, and I started trying to figure out what the psalm was about, and I just could not get them phrases out of my mind if it had not been for the Lord, if it had not been for the Lord. I was riding around, and it's, it's almost like God brought some things to my remembrance had it not been for the Lord. I remember one time I was about 15 years old, I was riding around with a bunch of guys. One of the guys I, I was running around, running around with at the time had his license. I'm riding down Highway 49 at 65 mile an hour, standing up in the back of a pickup truck like an idiot. I'm 15 foot from death and hell. I, I, and I had another friend. I don't know why I hung out with crazy people before, but I did. Um... <laughs> had another friend, and I don't even know how he got his license. I don't even know how he ever, I don't know why he went in a, in a padded jacket. Um, but for some reason, he thought it was funny at night for us to be riding through the country. And it's where Todd Hill Farm and 49 cross one another. And when we were coming at night, him going 65, 70 miles an hour, we had the stop sign. They had the right of way. He would turn his headlights off. And if he didn't see other headlights, he'd never, he'd just blow the stop sign. All it would have took would be the right night when a car was coming had it not been for the Lord. Amen. It's amazing. 
One night, I remember about at the age of 20, I was about 20 years old riding home one night after uh, with, a, with a sales team. I was, you know, I've told you all the story before. I was selling cars before I got saved. That should give you hope for anybody in the world. <laughs> and uh, I was riding back from a sales meeting one night, and I was the one driving, and it was a van load of about, I guess it was probably eight or ten of us in it. And um, I remember getting on 109, where we'll be going next Monday. And then I remember getting pushed in the back of my shoulder. And what I didn't realize is that I had dozed off. And we had started going off the road. And the guy behind me luckily was awake. And he hit me and he said, man, what are you, what are you, you better wake up. You can get us all killed. I was probably just a, maybe a few seconds away from going off the road. Had it not been for the Lord. Now, tonight, when I say that, I'm not the only person. Everybody in this building probably, especially older folk, got stories just like it. And I don't know about you, man, but I, I sit back sometimes and I ponder those now, especially after reading Psalms like this. I'm thinking, man, I was a breath from hell. I was one breath from instead of standing tonight and preaching the gospel, a saved man, eternally secure in Christ. Tonight, I could be burning. had it not been for the Lord. It makes me mad at myself whenever I fail him in my flesh. It makes me mad whenever I make excuses why I don't go deeper. Amen. I mean, so much has been done for me. I have no excuse. And that's not to mention, listen, that's not even to mention the fact that had, had my life been left to me and I would have been able to plan it out according to my own will, oh, I'd have messed it up so bad. I don't know about you, but at the age of almost 45, I sure am glad God took over. His plans for my life are so much better than what mine would have been. Amen. His will is always so much better than what I would have chosen for myself. And so tonight with the psalmist, I can say this. If it had not been for the Lord, things would have turned out a lot differently for me. Now, by the time you get to verse number seven, watch what, he's, watch what we see here concerning this idea of had it not been for the Lord. We also find, though, that not only is it what he saved us from, but it's what he offers us. We see in verse seven the victory that is available in the future. Watch what he says. Our soul is escaped. That's present tense. He's talking about at that very time. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. In other words, he's using an illustration here back in the, I don't know, I don't know if anybody does this anymore or not. Most of the time we just shoot them with shotguns now when it comes to birds. But back in those days, they would literally make traps for birds. That's what a, that's what a fowler is. It's a trap for a bird and a bird would get caught in it. And then they would, you know, trap the bird and kill the bird and I sell the bird or eat the bird. I don't know. Okay. But watch what he says in the last part of that verse. The snare is broken and we're escaped. Not only me from stuff from the past but only God knows what it saved me from right now <laughs> and what it would save me from in the future I've said this before I, I don't doubt at all had it not been for the Lord's uh, intervention in my life I don't doubt at all right now that he's the reason that we have been able to keep our marriage together I believe that with all my heart he drawn, he's drawn line in the sands that if you and I would just obey. Can I just stop for a minute and preach or, or, or something? I don't know what's going to get ready to come out, but some getting ready to fly. We're without excuse not to have what this book offers us. In other words, if me and Miss Ricky Beth are just listening to what God says about the issue of marriage, we can make it. It's in her best interest we make it. <laughs> I'm just going to just check and see if y'all's awake or not. It's really in my best interest if we make it, okay? I don't, <laughs> hey, man, hey, all right. And we won't, it won't be like the tribulation saints. We won't be enduring to the end to be saved. We can actually enjoy the ride. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. But God's given me instructions in that area. He's given me instructions on raising a family. He's given me instructions. Listen now. God has given me purpose for my life with eternal value. I'm not just making time and making memories. No, we're serving the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. And, and listen, this book tells us hard times are coming. No doubt. 
But I'm as convinced that just like Noah had a refuge, and I'm not, I'm not preaching some kind of pie in the sky. Look, I'm of the persuasion if God so allowed it tonight, he could lift the hedge of protection on America and you and I could be in prison tomorrow. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe that the, the, the rapture has to take place for that. Because Christians are being imprisoned somewhere in the world all the time. Martyred, mistreated. That could happen on American soil. I know it's hard to think about because it never has before, but it could. Okay? So I'm not preaching that. I'm just saying this tonight. Listen to me, listen to me well. I am glad tonight that because of the Lord being on our side, that even if that happens, I have a road map that tells me how believers have made it through it before. And my faith didn't have to crumble. And I don't have to doubt or question is what I believe was it right to begin with. If the bottom falls out tomorrow, and I know God's on my side, I'm of the persuasion that if Paul can sing in prison, so can you. If we end up there. If we end up on a firing line somewhere, as long as God's on my side, then he'll give me, look, if he can give me living grace and saving grace, he can give me dying grace. That day's coming. We're either going by the rapture or the grave. All of us are. And even if it's my old age, I still believe this, that God can be by my side and will be by my side regardless of what I face. Listen to me well tonight. I'm glad that victory, listen, victory is available. Not just in yesteryear, but for tomorrow. If I didn't believe that tonight, I'd be a nervous wreck. I would probably be on, I'd be a nervous wreck. Let me just say that. Okay? I mean, I would be a mess. If you read the book of Revelation, <laughs> And, and you ain't got confidence in your salvation. It should, it should really make your knees knock together. Because, I mean, it, before this thing winds up, it's going to get real bad. I never have understood why unsafe folk want to always talk about Armageddon in the book of Revelation. You don't want to be there. You better deal with Calvary and your sin problem because you don't want to be part of it. You don't want to be living in that stuff, man. Men will cry for the rocks to fall on them. They won't turn to Christ, but they'll cry to die and they can't even die. It's amazing. That brings us down to verses 6 and 8, the only two verses I've not touched yet. When it comes to this issue of the Lord being on our side, we see that we would have been hopeless without that taking place. Our situation would have turned out differently, but our victory is also available in the future. And in according to verse 6 and 8 of this psalm, our praise for the Lord being on our side is very fitting. Watch what he says. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. And then in verse 8, he says this, Our help is in the name of the Lord who hath made heaven and earth. Here's what the psalmist was saying. In light of the fact that the Lord chose to be on my side, I will not cease to praise him all my days. Listen, praise is not something it takes a team on a platform at church to get out of the congregation. Praise is something we give him. Worship is something we give unto him because of who he is and what he's done. You say, yeah, but life ain't quite going the way I want it to. It don't change the fact that the Lord's been on our side. And honestly, if you don't get technical about it, the only time we want to praise him is when everything's going right. It ain't about him, it's about us. It's not about what he's done, it's about what I'm getting it's about the variables of my life all. It's not going to be that way most of the time. If we, have, if we have to have everything lined up, the stars and everything else to praise him, we won't praise him much at all. Because you know why? As Job said, that man is born a woman, it's a few days full of trouble. But I'll tell you one thing about those troubles. I sure am glad that in the midst of them, the Lord's on my side. He chose to take that position in my life. And tonight, when you put it in perspective, there's so many outside of the family of God tonight. And this is not a Calvinistic statement I'm getting ready to make. It's just Bible. He chose you. And it's not that he hadn't chose them. But it's just that he did choose us. And for that, I feel plumb special about it. You know what it makes me want to do? Serve him, love him, and praise him. So here's the question tonight. Have you ever pondered what it might be like if the Lord hadn't been on your side? My story and your story would be a whole lot different than it is right now. And only God knows what that might look like. So tonight's a good night to be thankful that the Lord 
willingly chose to be on our side. Every head bowed every eye closed tonight. Sometimes you just need a reminder. And that's exactly what Psalm 124 is all about. Reminding you.